Okay, so now we're shifting a little bit from talking specifically about population to moving on to world migration, which is very much connected to the issues of migration. And in this quick slideshow, we're going to be talking about why does migration happen and what are maybe some patterns we notice in the maps and other data. And you're going to be asked to look at some data on some other sites as we go through. So here we go. So first off, some terminology. Migrate just means to move from one location to another. And a couple of terms that we'll be hearing. One is emigration, which is when you leave your origin, your country of origin, or maybe you're emigrating from a city to a new city. That's emigration. And this is typically caused by push factors. Push factors are reasons why people decide to leave a place of origin, whether it's a country, city, etc. And we'll give some more specific examples of that in a minute. Something you've probably heard a lot about is immigration. Immigration is when a migrant comes into a new location, a new country, a new city, and they are drawn into that place by pull factors. Pull factors are anything that draws an individual to that new location. And again, we'll talk about what those are in a second. All right, so looking at push and pull factors. Again, push factors push people away. They cause people to want to leave a place to emigrate. So the, the ones that are the most common are, are pretty much economic reasons. Most people move for economic reasons due to poverty in their, in their country or city. Uh, or having economic insecurity, you know, they don't have a stable job or at least potentially their job might be lost. People move for environmental reasons. There may be a, a natural disaster or maybe a, a drought of some kind. Third reason why a lot of people migrate is because of uh, what we call civil strife. Uh, could, you know, could be violence in a, in a place, uh, you know, gang violence could be religious persecution or political persecution, or, you know, in a lot of cases, a war could be the reason why, and fear of death, obviously, would be a big reason to move. Uh, also, development-induced, this is more common today in places where countries are growing rapidly and cities are expanding, and maybe that city or that area is, is being uh, growing so rapidly that it's pushing people further and further away from where they ori originated. Maybe the, 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 the city is gobbling up farmland and that's forcing farmers to move to uh, more rural areas or to maybe even give up farming altogether and move into a city, for example. So that's a push factor. Pull factors are basically just the opposite. Um, the push factor often is matched by a pull factor to a new area, right? So if you have of the pushback factor of poverty in your home country, you might be pulled to a new country because they're going to give you higher wages so you don't live in poverty uh, and you'll have a higher standard of living. Um, or also they just might have more jobs available to you, right? So that way you uh, will be able to actually find a job. Uh, pull factors also include things like political and religious freedom. You know, obviously that's a big reason why many people come to the United States. Um, also, other pull factors might just be things like better weather, uh, could be living closer to family. Uh, there's any number of reasons why people move to a new area, right? So these are all different types of pull factors that we might uh, experience. All right, so looking at international migration, there's two types, and most people fall under this category, what we call voluntary migration, meaning they're choosing to move from one location to another. And like I said a little earlier, most people move because of economic reasons, meaning they're looking for a better job or they're looking for a more stable job or they're looking for a place where their money will go further. So most migrants are voluntary. And if you look around the globe today at this map, you can see that traditional areas that have been sources of international migration tend to be areas that are wealthier, right? You look at North America, United States and Canada, you look at 
most of Europe, Western Europe in particular, you look at Australia. These are all parts of the world that are much more highly developed, as we've seen, have higher GDPs and GDP per capita, and they have you know, high demand for labor, and so a lot of people have moved to these parts of the world to find jobs and find better income. But as you can see, as the world has become more developed, you see new areas where people are migrating to looking for jobs and other opportunities. Uh, for example, you can see here in Eastern Europe, right, you've seen a lot more uh, people migrating into these regions because they're developing faster than other parts of the world. Um, you look at places like in India, regions of India, okay, where you're having uh, a much more advanced economy, and particularly in large cities, and so you have migrants going into uh, those more developed parts of India. You can see it in China, right along the coast where most of their factories are. You have lots of people migrating to these parts of China to get jobs. Um, you also can also see that the lighter brown color represents sources of international migrants and also internal migrants, which we'll talk more about. And these are places that are sending more migrants to new places, right? So you can see, like in India, parts that are not the darker brown, the lighter brown colors, people are moving from the rural areas to these bigger cities that are more developed. Or in China, they're moving from the internal part of China to the coastal region. Um, you can see Southern Africa, you have the countries in near South Africa sending migrants to places like South Africa. Or you can see in this, the big cities of South America, the internal migrants and the migrants from other countries moving to these bigger cities in South America. So international migration you've seen going up significantly and you're finding new areas of the world where migrants are going. They're not all going to the same locations that they once did, right? There, there's now more competition essentially for migrants. Now, the other type of mig migrant international labor is forced migration. And there are, these are types of migrants that have had no choice. They, they are forced to move due to forces beyond their control, such as a war or persecution uh, by the government, for example. And we've heard a lot about in the last few years about refugees. But there's also a group that's not as well known that are actually uh, pretty significant. These are people called internally displaced people, people that don't necessarily leave the country that they live in, but they've been forced to flee their, their home due to violence or natural disaster or some other uh, factor that they can't control. So I'm going to get out of this really quickly, and I'm going to go to this website right here. Uh, this is the United Nations High Commission on Refugee Statistics, and this was only to 2018, but I think you get a good example of what's going on in the world. Uh, and you can see that there are a lot of refugees and internally displaced people around the globe, particularly in the areas of the world that are less well off, right? And so if we look at the, the map here, you can see refugees are in pink, asylum seekers are in this bluish color, and in what we call internally displaced persons uh, are, are this kind of greenish, bluish color, right? And you can see internally displaced people are twice the number of refugees around the world, right? So more migrants are internally displaced than they are uh, forced to go to other countries, at least forced migrants. And if you were to look at this, right? Most of the developing world areas that are not as highly developed have lots of internally displaced people uh, with smaller, in particular areas, uh, refugees. Some countries have more refugees than internally displaced, but you can see that you know a lot of them have internally displaced, and that's because of, of you know wars and whatnot that have taken place. So just to kind of zoom in a little bit, you can kind of get a better sense. For example, I'm sure you've heard a lot about like Syria, right? Syria has had a lot of refugees, but Internally displaced persons are a far larger amount of the situation in Syria, right? Over 6 million internally displaced people, not as many refugees. But if you go to neighboring Turkey, 3 million refugees, uh, which are predominantly Syrian, right? Because they're the next door neighbor to Syria. And you can see the same thing in a country like Lebanon or in Jordan. 
countries that are neighboring Syria have lots of refugees. But if you go to like a country like Afghanistan, lots of internally displaced people, right? And a country like Pakistan, many more refugees. All right. Now, what about countries like the United States, right? The United States has quite a few asylum seekers, people that are seeking asylum from other countries, not as many refugees, right? Uh, if you go into places like in Africa, there you go. let's go to Africa a little bit, right? You can see the Democratic Republic of Congo, right? Lots of internally displaced people as a result of a, of a ongoing um, ethnic violence there. Not as many refugees, but if you go to neighboring countries like Uganda, refugees have flooded into Uganda from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, same thing in places like Rwanda and Burundi. Okay, Violence in one country has led to more refugees in other places. Okay, So we can look at this map, and it tells us a lot about forced migration around the globe and why people have been out, you know, forced to leave their homes and due to many, many different factors. The last group on this list are, are trafficked individuals, people that are bought and sold as essentially slaves. And we're going to be studying more about human trafficking next week. But just to kind of give you an idea, we think about the Atlantic slave trade, what most Americans are, are familiar with, right, where they forcibly removed Africans and brought them to the Americas as slaves. And that is the slave trade as most people know it. But we'll be looking at more recent examples of human trafficking or modern day slavery. And what we notice in the map is that in many parts of the world where you have poverty and corruption in the governments, um, the uh, instances of human trafficking are much higher. And while this map is a little dated, uh, you, know, they're, you know, they don't have exact numbers all the time, you can still get a sense of where human trafficking is a problem and where you know, people have been not necessarily kidnapped, but have been tricked and brought into a trafficking situation and then brought to other parts of the world. And you can see that there's, you know, there is a strong connection between economic stability, economic growth, and countries that have human trafficking issues. And we'll take a deeper look at that next week. And finally, don't want to talk about the politics of immigration too much, but obviously we do want to recognize that international migration can be very controversial. And migrants, uh, particularly migrants who maybe are of a different cultural background, do create a backlash in many countries. Um, and we particularly think about the United States. There's been a history of backlash against different immigrant groups, whether it was the Chinese in the 1800s or before that resistance to Irish immigrants or Italian immigrants or immigrants uh, later on from Eastern Europe uh, in the more modern times, thinking about immigrants from particularly Latin America, Mexico in particular, there's been backlash against them and laws have been put in place to try to limit or restrict or even to prevent them altogether from coming to the United States, such as the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, but this is not uh, strictly an American phenomenon. This is going on all over the world, right? There's been a huge backlash in Europe uh, to many migrants coming in from uh, particularly the Middle East and Asia, uh, fears about changing of culture. But this is not strictly a European problem or a European ethnic problem. It's also a problem in other parts of the world, right? For example, due to the coronavirus, there's been a backlash in places like China against immigrants coming into China and potentially bringing the coronavirus to 
the country or back to the country. And so backlash against migrants is nothing new. And the fears about immigrants coming into a country are often much more overstated than they actually are. But just recognize that those things do exist. So that's a quick intro on international migration, and you'll be doing some assignments on this issue over the next week. And we look forward to discussing this with you during our office hours this week.